to be doing this anyway. Alhamdulillah. This actually started from thinking. Um, Assalamu alaikum. The inspiration came from thinking one of my ustads, Habib. He asked me because um, I was in a bit of a thingy, a uh, bit of a mixed matchup, which was do I do medicine or do I choose this path where I complete my anime program first? So one of my ustads, he said to me, um, his point was, uh, do you want to become one doctor or do you want to help nurture 15 doctors? I said, would you just want to be one doctor yourself or do you want to affect the lives of 15 potential doctors? So I thought, let me, let me choose the path where I can at least help 15 probably. And then Alhamdulillah, Allah accepted. So tell him he's going to get me that. He said he's going to get me a Porsche. If he becomes uh, rich, so that, okay, that's all right then. The seventh lesson, uh, we'll G, seventh lesson, inshallah. Really, we need to read it, right? Allahumma inni asaluka khayraha wa khayra ma fiha wa ma urusilat biha wa a'udhu bika min sharriha wa sharri ma ursilat biha and wa sharri ma fiha very powerful though oh Allah we ask you for the goodness of the wind what the wind brings and for what reason he was sent with we ask protection from its evil and with the evil he was sent with Allah We are on verse number 14 today, inshallah. Everybody, Allah. Chigul Stein, inshallah. Bismillah, Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, he robbed the army. Well, I'm Kibatulil Mutankina, or Salah to a Salam, or Allah, say he did more sanin. Well, Imam Il Mutankina, or Allah, and he was Sabi, or Baroka, or Salam, and Taslim, and Kasir, and Kasir. Am I bad to far out to be lahim, a shinkani, or Jim, Missmilah, or Rahman, or Rahim? Why is a local Ladina, Amanu, Kalu, Aman? Why is a hollow Ila Shayatin, him, Kalu, in a maracum, in a man, a no mustahzion? الله يستهزئ بهم ويمدهم في طغيانهم يعمهون أولئك الذين اشتروا الضلالة بالهدى فما ربحت تجارتهم وما كانوا مهتدين مثلهم كمثل الذي استوقد نارا فلما أضاءت ما حوله ذهب الله بنورهم وتركهم في ظلمات لا يبصرون صم بكم عمي فهم لا يرجعون أو كصيب من السماء فيه ظلمات ورعد وبرق يجعلون أصابعهم في آذانهم من الصواعق حذر الموت والله محيط بالكافرين يكاد البرق يخطف أبصارهم كلما أضاء لهم مشوا فيه وإذا أظلم عليهم قاموا ولو شاء الله لذهب بسمعهم وأبصارهم إن الله على كل شيء قدير وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل أقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب زدنا علما بالقرآن العظيم وبسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله only through the sheer mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a very extremely windy evening, Allah still blessed us with the ability, the tawfiq to gather 
in a gathering wherein the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be discussed. There is a hadith of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated in Sahih Bukhari by Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu who says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said khayrukum, the best amongst you khayrukum man ta'allam al-Qur'ana wa'allama is the one who learns the Qur'an and the one that teaches the Qur'an. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen all of us sitting here and those joining us uh, online we have been blessed to be part of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we are regarded to be the best amongst the people. Why is this the case? Because it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sole purpose why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent was to be with this Qur'an, with the book of Allah. It's just the extreme mercy of Allah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, today is the seventh lesson of the tafsir and we are continuing on from verse number 14. Last week we explained from verse number 13 how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Allah says that believe the way the people believed. And we explained here that all the Mufassirin, the masters of tafsir, agree that the people, by that it is meant Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and how they were very, very favored in the court of Allah. Why were they favored? Because they accepted Iman in such conditions that now they have left that example for the rest of mankind till the day of Qiyamah. So we're continuing on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 13 verses is speaking about the hypocrites. And they're a very uh, cursed group of people. Allah doesn't like it. Allah says, if you don't believe, for you there were two verses. Clear cut. You don't believe, no problem. You believe, there were five verses. And now when you don't believe, but you pretend to believe, you're a hypocrite, you're a munafiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really, really despises this. Regarding this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the last side of Juz 5, in Surah An-Nisa, Allah says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ that indeed the hypocrites, they will be in the lowest and the most deepest pits of Jahannam. They will be there burning. Even the disbelievers will not be in the final stage. Why? Because you were two-faced. You showed two faces. Allah does not like this. So Allah continues to say, وَإِذَا لَقُلْ لَذِينَ آمَنُوا When they meet the believers, what do they say? قَالُوا آمَنَّا We believe when they go with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when they sit with the companions, and when these people will come later on, all they will say that we, we, we believe, we're part of you. We're part of you, we believe. We believe the way you believe. However, وَإِذَا خَلَوْ إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ But when they go alone, the word khalaw in the Arabic language is to, used to explain that when they're sitting in secret, so they won't do this openly. Openly they'll be believers. But behind doors, in the darkest parts of the night, in areas where no one will see them, they will go khalaw, in loneliness, being alone with who? Shayateenihim, with their shaitans. So what does this mean? From this the ulama explained the word shayateen is used. They will be with their devils, with their shaitan. Does that mean they'll be sitting with a few jinns? No, they'll be sitting with the humans. So here we understand a very important point, the shayateen. Shaitan is not only in the form of jinn and shaitan that Allah has created. Iblis is the leader of all the shayateen. He is called shaitan. That's why we say, A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajim. We seek refuge in Allah from the cursed shaitan. But the way he has his own army of mini mini shayateen and jinnat that are shaitan, those the creatures that are made out of fire, human beings can also be shaitan. They can be classed as shayateen that their hearts become so black and darkened, that now they are classed as devils, as shayateen. So Allah says that in front of you, they will say they believe, but when they go and they are alone with their shaitan, with these evil people, these corrupt people, what do they say to them? قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ We're actually with you. إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهْزِئُونَ All we're doing is mocking them. We're trying to fool them. We're trying to fool these believers. And this is exactly what happened at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that they would fool Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How? They would go to Rasulullah and say, yes, yes, we're with you. Rasulullah would say, that, what do you think regarding this? They would be amongst the Rasul and say, yes, we agree. Let's do this, let's do that. Amongst them, the Ra'isul Munafiqeen, the leader of all of the Munafiqeen was um, Abdullah ibn Salul. He was a Jewish man at the time of Medina Munawwara, and he pretended to accept Islam. Abdullah ibn Sulu is his name. And Abdullah ibn Ubay is his other name. Both are referring to the same person. So he used to come to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a chief. And he used to pretend to represent the rest of his tribe in Medina. And he used to pretend to be a believer. 
But in the battle of Uhud we find he's amongst those that try to spread the rumor that Rasulullah has passed away. He said to the companions and to the other munafiqeen, the hypocrites, the retreat. We can't face the, you know, the people of Makkah that are going to attack us. Let's all retreat. So when Rasulullah is going forward, he's giving the command and he's giving the voice of the let's retreat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says regarding these people that they go to their people and they say that we're with you. We don't believe. I'm at luncheon last week. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before his demise, demise from the face of this earth, he gave a few names. In one narration we find he gave 14 names of the arch hypocrites of that time. These names were given to Hazrat Hudayfa ibn Yaman radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who is known to be Sidru Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the secret keeper of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We find regarding Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he used to say himself when he was the Khalifa of Islam that I would only lead because you're the leader of the believers he needs to lead the Janazah Salah he says I would look out if Hudayfa ibn Yaman is here if Hudayfa ibn Yaman is present, then I would go forward and lead the salah. But if Hudayfa ibn Yaman was not present when a person passed away in Medina, I would not go and lead the salah. I would make an excuse and tell someone else to lead the salah. Because if Hudayfa is there, then I know that this person is a believer. If Hudayfa isn't taking part, I know he's not a believer. How much iman did Umar have? He himself says regarding himself that he goes to Hudayfa. Ya Hudayfa, hal ana minhum? Am I amongst that list? Because I know you won't tell me that you will stay true to the secret of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But hal ana minhum? Am I amongst that list? Is the name of Umar in the list of hypocrites? Tell me. Who they used to say, "Yaqulu li la." You're not part of them. You're not part of them. Don't worry. This is how attentive he was, and this is how uh, scared they were regarding this verse of the glorious Quran. So these hypocrites say, "Innama nahnu mustahzi'un." So we're only mocking them. We're making a fool of them. Allah replies saying, Allahu yastazi'u bihim. They think they're mocking. They think they're mocking the believers. That is not the case. Allah will be mocking them. Yastazi'u bihim. Allah is the one that's going to be doing the mocking. How dare they, how dare they say this? The ulama explain here, how can Allah, how can Allah do the mocking? Here the word yastahziu, Imam Qurtubi, rahimahullah ta'ala says, here it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely, definitely punish them. In English we have a saying that we'll see who gets the last laugh. We'll see who gets that last laugh. The ulama explain this was meant here. That Allah is saying Allah will have the last laugh. Do what you're doing, no problem. You want to destroy the world, you want to cause corruption, continue. Continue to cause corruption. Continue to say what you want to say. But just know that Allah will grip you. And when Allah grips you and Allah holds firm to you, no, you're not going to escape his punishment anymore. Allah will make a mockery of you. So Allah says to them, continue to say, no problem. Continue to say that you're making a mockery of the deen of Allah. You're not. All you're doing is, you're just upholding the fact that Allah will make a mockery of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further says, وَيَمُدُّهُمْ فِي تُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ Allah lets them wander, blindly, يَعْمَهُونَ Blindly in their rebellionship. That they're going around causing mischief. Oh, we're believers. Oh, and then they go back and they spy on the believers. They attend the masjid. They attend events. They attend programs. They show themselves to be believers. Know that Allah knows all this. You can try. You can carry on trying to make a mockery. You can try to investigate. And you can go report back to your friends and to your shayateen. Allah says, Allah <coughs> allows them to do this. Ya'mahun. Here the word in Arabic, Ya'mahun means blindly. That Allah said, go on, carry on. What sort of blindly? Blindness of the heart. That their hearts, as we explained before, is an illness, a disease in their hearts. Fi qulubihim marad. They have a disease in their hearts. They are liars. They have this disease. And now they have become blinded. And Allah allows them to wonder. Lost. That you portray to be something that you're not. How can you continue living a life where you're fake to yourself? Why, why go through the effort of pretending to be something half the day or you know, three quarters of the day and then pretend to be something else later? Why? Why take yourself through this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about them. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while speaking about them, Allah does something. This is the first time in the Quran Allah brings an analogy. Allah brings an example, a parable. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is teaching me and you as the human being that when we teach and when we are addressing a group of people, when we are trying to communicate our ideas, our business, our worldly affairs, whatever we are doing, it's not enough for the human being to understand without an example. Allah says that maybe you have understood my point yet. Maybe you have understood how severe these munafiqeen, these hypocrites are. Allah now says, let me bring for you an example. This will be the first example in the glorious Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah right now. After bringing this example, we will find, inshallah, when we get to verse number, approximately verse number 24-25, Allah will mention this. Because there will be a question now. Why does Allah, who, why does Allah feel the need to bring examples? Allah he himself, after a few more verses, will explain. When Allah will say, Inna Allah, la yastahi. Allah does not feel any sort of haya, any sort of that, you know, loneliness. That, that Allah brings an example for you. So Allah will explain this, inshallah, when we get there. For now, let's understand this analogy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أولئك الذين اشتروا الضلالة بالهدى فما ربحت تجارتهم وما كانوا مهتدين. When we said that Allah will make a mockery of them, we have to also keep in mind it's not only going to be Allah making a mockery and a fool of these people. On the day of Qiyamah, those people and those believers that they hurt and they persecuted and they made mockery of. On the day of Qiyamah, we find in Surah Al-Mutaffifin, verse number 34, Allah says, فَالْيَوْمَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنَ الْكُفَّارِ يَضْحَكُونَ That on the day of Qiyamah, on that day, those that believed, يضحكون, they will be laughing at these hypocrites and these, these disbelievers. They will be laughing at them. So the believers will be getting the last laugh. When they will wear, they will be sitting on high thrones. They will be preparing to go to Jannah and they will see these liars. And these hypocrites and these, these, these disbelievers, and they will laugh at them. Look at you, look at you today. You tried to dishonor us in the world, now look at you today, and they will laugh. Allah will allow them to laugh on their faces on the day of Qiyamah. So no, nothing to worry about. This life is very temporary. It may be 60, 70 years. Have patience. Continue with the test that Allah and the trials that Allah sends me and you. Know that if you are true to Allah, then you will be the one with the, the, the final laugh. Inshallah, Rahman. Allah says they are those people who have bought. Allah will now use the example of business. First example will be of business that they have bought ad-dalalata bil huda. They have bought misguidance in the place of guidance. That they have sold the chance to be a believer. Why? You're living with the believers. You're hearing what they're believing. You're hearing what they are also hearing. You are sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You are taking part in the event that thousands have gathered. To listen regarding the deen of Allah. You've also come, but you've come with the intention of, intention of let's find out what these speakers are saying. Let's try to grip, you know, grab on them, them on them points where, they're, when they, where they sound extreme or where they've made a little slip of the tongue. Let's find out what they're saying. You're in the gathering of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as was uh, the speech to the munafiqeen of the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and to the munafiqeen today. That you're sitting in that gathering where people will be crying. People will be changing their life. They will leave this event and there will be so many people who have done a very powerful repentance to Allah. And they're going to change their life. You're sitting in this but you have sold your, this chance of guidance for misguidance. Allah says, what? You have done this? فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ This business transaction of theirs has brought them no profit. The why? Why did you do this? Is there a fool in this world that makes a business idea, they make all the effort to start this business, and then all the profit, the business goes to shambles. Nothing happens for them. Allah says, you're worse than them. You made the effort of trying to misguide yourself. You're not even going to be guided. You've sold guidance. You've made the worst of transactions. You've given away your deen. You have given away the chance to be uh, f- to find the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you've given that away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says, Mathaluhum. Their example is, nara, is the example of that man who kindles a fire. Someone who kindles a fire. And then with this fire, what does he do? He finds that it illuminates everything around him. 
When you have a torch, when you have a candle or anything of light, it illuminates everything around that person. Why? There's a chance to see, where do I go, what do I do? Allah says that this person, he's got this light. He has kindled a fire, he's seeing everything around him. Because a fire, it doesn't go in one direction. The light goes in a circular direction. You're allowed to see in every way and in every direction. That's how powerful light is. So he's allowed to see everything around him, but he's not sincere. ذَهَبَ اللَّهُ بِنُورِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take away this light. That he had the chance to see this candle. It's gone. And where is he left in? وَتَرَكَهُمْ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ اللَّهِ يُبْسِرُونَ He's left in complete darkness. They can't see. Here in the Arabic language, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something amazing. وَتَرَكَهُمْ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ Allah doesn't say that and they are left now in darkness of ilal bi dhulma, which is one in Arabic. Here is dhulumat, which is plural in the Arabic language, which means layers of darkness. It's not one darkness. That they think that they're seeing for that few seconds where there's that chance of them accepting Islam. There's the light. They can look around, find direction. It goes away because they're not true to the fact that they want iman. They're liars. That light goes away. They're in complete, utter layers of darkness, 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 darkness. There's complete darkness. Dhulumat. Here the ulama make an amazing point. And this is for every single person sitting here and for everyone listening. Do we complain? Oh, Oldham, Ashton, wherever we're from, there's nothing happening. There's no effort of deen. Wherever we've studied, oh, there's no effort of deen happening. There's not enough happening. You see the mindset should not be that. The mindset should be the incomplete darkness, even the most, how do you, the dimmest of all of candles seems very bright. In complete darkness, if I just give you a spark of a candle, small little flame, even that, if you were, if this whole room was completely pitch black and I set a candle there, small little flicker of a candle, small little flame, all of us sitting here will be able to go to the corner of that room. Because in complete darkness, even a small candle seems very bright and there's a lot of hope. That's why the ulama explain that even if you have that ounce of goodness inside you, even that ounce of effort of deen, that you're trying to do something amongst all of the darknesses, I swear by Allah, that small candle will still be seen. And it'll be something that everyone will run towards. And when everyone comes towards it, if we try to get, you know, if it's a very cold room and we try to take heat from that small candle, it wouldn't be enough. But as soon as we gather together, it won't be the heat of the candle that we need anymore. Because we're all sitting together, our body heat will be enough. So from that we understand that even a small little candle can be a means of hope. So the ulama explain here that this person had the chance. The candle was lit. There was a small flame, but it went away. So when there was a small hope, he took it away from his own life. Allah Ta'ala was so displeased with him. That why? Why do you be, why are you a liar to yourself? Why do you lie? And now he's in utter, utter darkness. yubsirun. In what state though? Is he just in darkness? That everything around him is dark? No. Allah now says, Summum bukmun umyun. He's in a room of complete darkness. He's deaf. He's dumb and he's blind. So if there's already darkness, does a, does a blind person know the difference between darkness or not? They're already blind, they can't see. But Allah says they're in this complete darkness, they've become deaf, they've become dumb, and they've also become blind. So darkness after darkness after darkness, every avenue of hope has been shut away from that person. This is how much Allah is saying that I'm not happy with these hypocrites. This is how, how much Allah is saying I don't like them. That this is wrong what they are doing. So now Allah says, you want to be wrong to my deen, to my religion? Then know that you will be placed in such darknesses, فَهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ You will never be able to return back. You're not going to come back anymore. If this is the path that you have chosen, that you want to lie, that you have chosen the path that I want to cause harm to the deen of Allah, I want to cause harm to Rasulullah wasallam. then know that you have put yourself into complete darkness. That's the first example Allah uses, the first analogy. Now it's possible that someone sitting here or those that are studying the book of Allah, they still don't understand that, okay, a person with a small flame, he finds you know, some sort of hope, 
some sort of direction, the flame is gone, he's in darkness, utter darkness, now he becomes blind, he becomes deaf, he becomes dumb, he's never going to come back. Is that not enough of an example for you? Allah says, Let me tell, Allah says, let me tell you of a second example. It is like the rainstorm, sayyib in the Arabic language means rainstorm. It is like the rainstorm which is coming from the heavens, fihi dhulumatun. There is darkness in this rainstorm. They imagine a scene where it's raining, heavy rain. The clouds and the sky have been darkened. Everything is dark around you. Dhulumat, complete darkness. Wa ra'dun, you can hear thunder. Wa barq, you, you can hear lightning. Here the word ra'dun is a very important word. There is a surah in the Juz 13 of the glorious Quran called Surah to Ra'd. The Surah of Thunder. What does Ra'ad mean? This was asked to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Hadith of Sahih Tirmizi, uh, Jamiyu Tirmizi, Hadith number 3117, we find a group of Jews came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said to him, Mar Ra'ad, what is Ra'ad? What is this Ra'ad and Thunder that we speak of? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Malakun min al malaika. This is an angel from the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has a whip of fire. This angel has a whip of fire and he uses this whip of fire to drive the clouds in a certain direction as is the command of Allah. So then the Jews asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but then what's that sound that we hear? The rumbling and that rumbling thunder sound. What is that? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, this is when this angel is using the whip, he is lashing the whip and he is directing the clouds to a certain way, to a certain direction, to a certain place to gather. That whipping that this angel of Allah is doing, that is the sound of thunder. When Rasulullah said this, قالوا, the Jewish people said, Sadaqta, you have spoken the truth. We have also found this in the Torah, in our book of, uh, our book of Revelation, which is the Old Testament, which is the book of the Jews, the Torah. So Rasulullah says, Ra'ad is the name of an angel meaning who has this work. And because we ourselves cannot see this angel, we translate it as thunder. That it's the thunder taking part. It's actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a lot of superstition behind it. Some say that, oh, shaitan is being beaten up or uh, it's, been, it's for shaitan to be attacked or something. That we have not found in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Rather, it is the clouds forming and this angel of Allah. And Imam Tirmizi says, Hadha hadithun hasanun sahih. That this is an authentic hadith. So then, there is a rainstorm. There is complete darkness. You can hear the thunder. You can hear lightning. And you can see lightning. Yaj'aluna asabi'ahum. And when these people see this rainstorm, what do they do? Fi adhanihim min as hadar al maut. They place their fingers inside their ears to save themselves from the sawaiq. What is the sawaiq? That is the sound of thunder. That when thunder is rumbling and it's that fear, just so they don't hear that devastating loud sound, they put their ears in their, uh, they put their hands in their ears to save themselves from death. It's possible that this fear and this sound of thunder will give us death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they are these same people. These disbelievers, i.e. these munafiqin, these hypocrites, they are like those people that are in the storm. That they see the storm around them, darkness, thunder, lightning. And they try to save themselves by what? By putting their fingers inside their ears. When lightning wants to strike, it's not the sound that's going to kill you. It's going to be the actual lightning that's going to kill you. So Allah says, look, they are so misguided, they don't even know how to react. They don't even know what to do. They don't even know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with them. And they're making decisions that are very, you know, worthless. Allah then says, Wallahu muhitun bil kafirin. Allah is the one that encompasses the disbelievers. Here we find that the munafiq, the hypocrite, is a disbeliever. He is a kafir. Why? He also disbelieves. But he pretends to be a believer. So Allah says that Allah will encompass all of these disbelievers. Allah will destroy them all. So Allah wants me and you to uh, keep that in mind. Yakadu al It is close that this thunder, yakhtafu abasarahum. The flashing of the thunder will snatch away their eyes. That they're in this darkness. And you know sometimes when you're in complete darkness and someone puts a light on, what happens? How do you feel? Oh, switch it off, switch it off. Now you feel, oh no, no, switch the light off, man. It's too, you know, it's too bright. 
So they're in this complete darkness, in this rainstorm. As soon as they see the thunder, it's, you know, it's a scary feeling. It's, it's a, a sudden flash of light. It's close that they will become blind. When they see the thunder, what do they do? When they see that there is light, they try to find their way towards shelter. They run, they walk towards shelter. As soon as the thunder stops and it becomes dark, they stand still. They stand still because they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. Some light comes again. Oh, we found some direction. Let's go towards this. Light stops. They don't know where to go anymore. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of, of, of them in this way that they're looking. They still have their senses. But Allah says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ Allah." They have their senses, meaning they have the chance to see Iman. They have the chance to accept Islam and Iman. They don't want to. So Allah says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ Allah." If Allah wants, لَذَهَبَ بِسَمْعِهِمْ وَأَبْصَارِهِمْ Allah will take away their eyes and Allah will take away their ears. Here's a very, very important point. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he's referring to this right now, he only mentions three, two senses. He, Allah says, Summun bukmun umyun. From the senses, Allah says, deaf, dumb and blind. So being dumb isn't a sense. It's more to do with your aql and your brain and your intellect. But Allah says, deaf and blind. And here Allah says again, that we will take, uh, it is close to Allah now. In this scenario, when there, there is a thunderstorm, they can't see anything. They wait for the flashing of the thunder, but they're scared of the noise that they're going to die. Then they put their hands on their ears. Uh, they put their fingers inside their ears because they're scared. Now they wait for the light so they can go towards shelter. They don't find shelter. They stop. Allah will now put them in such a severe situation. They're going to become blind. They're going to become deaf in this rainstorm. Why these two senses? The ulama explain knowledge. To acquire knowledge from amongst our five senses, the greatest two senses that when they are together and when they work together, you have the greatest tool to acquire knowledge and acquire guidance. It is your sight and it is your ears. This is why from the miracles that Allah sent, He sent two. One was seeing Rasulullah wasallam, and one was hearing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From this we understand something very, very important. Allah doesn't say here intellect, that you have to be clever to accept Islam, that you have to have a brain to understand Islam. No. Have some sense. See enough. Hear enough. That is enough for you to find guidance. And how misfortunate are me and you that Allah has blessed us with both of these. Both of these abilities of sight and of uh, hearing, yet we still go against Allah with these very eyes and with these very ears. That we see those things that Allah is not happy with and we listen to those things that Allah is not happy with. But there are some people that they are blind, but they learn to recite the Quran with prayer. One of my respected teachers, uh, Maulana Shuaim Nahuda Sahib, who is from Preston, our teacher of uh, Hadith, our teacher of Mantiq, and our teacher of Akhida, he explained to us, he started a new project in uh, Preston where he himself to teach Braille Quran, he himself learned Braille Quran. He had to close his eyes and he had to learn how to read the Quran without his eyes. And he learned Braille Quran and now he, start, he started uh, teaching Braille Quran to the extent he's making a half of the Quran through Braille. So they use their senses to the, without even having the sense of sight, they still are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I mentioned this in Hadith class, that there is a Hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in a Hadith of Sahih Muslim, mentioned by in Riyadh al-Salihin, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tests His beloved servant with two of His beloved things, i.e. Habibaini, His two beloved eyes. That Allah takes away His eyesight, Allah doesn't give Him eyesight, but in return, awwadahu Allah al-Jannah. Allah will give Him Jannah in the place of His eyesight. So Allah gives this. Allah takes away for some and He allows them to use the rest of their senses in true fashion. There are some people who are deaf that they can't hear the words of the Quran the way me and you can hear. They can't listen to the great reciters of the Quran, the reciters of Mecca, of Medina, and all around the world, the great shuyukh of Quran. They can't listen to them. Despite not being able to listen to them, they still recite Quran. They still learn about the deen of Allah. Me and you have both. So Allah says these people around Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they had both. And the majority of people have both talents, the both uh, senses of uh, sight and of hearing. 
but they still choose to go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to uh, ask Allah for forgiveness, for misusing our eyes, for misusing our hearing. Many people, rather than listen to the glorious Quran, we busy ourselves in listening to those things that create a evil inside our heart, that create hypocrisy in our heart. Many people, rather than looking at good things, looking towards those things that will give us a reward. Looking at our parents, we find in the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Alad al that if you look at your father or your mother with an affection, with a source of love, Allah will give the reward of Hajj and Umrah. If you look towards the house of Allah, the Kaaba, your du'as will be accepted and Allah will reward you just on merely looking at the house of Allah. By looking at the words of the glorious Qur'an, you're also uh, rewarded. Just by looking at the letter form of the glorious Qur'an, you are rewarded for using your eyes appropriately. If a husband was to walk home and he was to see his wife and he is happy with his wife and he smiles at her by seeing his wife because she has appeared herself to be pleasing, he is pleased with her. We find in the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi an announcement is made for that wife. The way your husband is happy with you, oh dear wife, know that Allah is also happy with you. How powerful these senses are. Our hearing, where does guidance come from? It comes from these. You hear good words, you hear good things, and it enters your heart. They are both channels towards your heart. These, this blessing of the, our uh, hearing and the blessing of our sight, they are both avenues to get to this heart. And this is the way to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to be able to use these avenues properly. Allah thereafter says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ That no, Allah has power over everything. Allah ends these 13 verses regarding the hypocrites saying, do what you want to do. Whatever you want to do, know at the end of the day, Allah has power over everything. You are those that are trying to make a mockery of the deen of Allah, know that Allah has power over everything. You want to fool the believers, the Muslims, know that Allah has power over everything. Are you one that you will try to corrupt the earth? Fasad, you will uh, cause destruction, you will spread evil and disorder around the world. Know that Allah still has power over everything. Are you one that says that we're just lying, we don't want to believe like them. We're just doing it for the sake of showing off and showing the people. Know that Allah has power over everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives a very severe warning to these people. To the extent we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with warning also. When Abdullah ibn Salul passed away, he was the leader of all of the hypocrites at the time of Medina Munawwara. We find in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, his son Abdullah came. And Abdullah said, O oh Rasulullah, my father has passed away, Abdullah ibn Salul, can you please come and lead the janazah salah? So that you know, it's possible that Allah has some sort of mercy towards him. Umar radiallahu anhu is with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says, Messenger of Allah, we all know, you know also, that he was a disbeliever. You know that he was a hypocrite. You know he was a liar. Rasulullah says, oh, Umar, I still will fulfill this request. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa offers the janazah salah. Abdullah, his son Abdullah, he's called Abdullah, his son is also called Abdullah, who's a true believer. Abdullah says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, please give your garment so that it can be used to shroud my father. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam still gives away his uh, shroud. Hafiz ibn Hajr al-Asqalani says that this will not be enough for this Abdullah ibn Sudur either. Even the blessed shroud of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will not be enough to save this person. But Rasulullah did this, why? We find that when Abbas was uh, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came and he was captured after the battle of, uh, one of the battles, one of the main battles, Tabuk, when uh, Abbas came, he was a very tall person. And the only person that was similar to his height was this Abdullah ibn Salul. So he, to show his appreciation to the Prophet sallallahu he gave one of his garments away to Abbas because Abbas wasn't covered properly. And this is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu So Abbas was given a shroud. So Rasulullah remembered this favor and on the deathbed of Abdullah ibn Salul, Rasulullah gave his garment to him for his burial. But this, why did Rasulullah do this? Because Rasulullah was such a man that whatever favor you did to him in this very world, he would fulfill everyone's favor. Except for one. Rasulullah himself says, there's only one person that I've never been able to fulfill their favor. And that is the favor of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Only Allah will be able to fulfill his favor. What Abu, uh, what Abu Bakr did for me. So Rasulullah fulfilled that favor of, his, uh, of Abdullah ibn Salul. He, this Abdullah ibn Salul, 
after he passes away, Rasulullah is making a dua. The verse was revealed that if you make a dua of Juz number 10 of Surah Al Bara'a, uh, Surah Al Tawbah, that O Muhammad, وسلم, if you make dua for him 70 times or you don't make dua for him, لا يغفر الله. Allah will never forgive him. So here Rasulullah said to Umar, that Umar, Allah said to me, if I want to make dua, I don't want to make dua, you know, I can still make dua, I've got the option to make dua. Thereafter, after the burial, we find the verse of the glorious Quran is revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh Muhammad, from this day on, you are not allowed to stand in salah for any hypocrite anymore. You have been given the information who is a hypocrite. No longer are you allowed to stand and pray for any of them. Allah scolds Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah isn't happy with them. These people, Allah is saying, you're not allowed either. You're not allowed to make a dua for them. You're not allowed to stand in salah for them. You're not allowed to lead the janazah salah. You have no relation with them. If they pass away, let it be the case. And in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we find so many incidences where Rasulullah sallallahu was tested like this. Hypocrites would say things to Rasulullah sallallahu This Abdullah ibn Salul, his worst of all of his crimes is when he spoke and he spread the rumor of Aisha radiallahu anha. When he spoke against our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, he said that Aisha did some wrong with Safwan ibn Mu'attal, that she fornicated, that so she went against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He spread this. Rasulullah was so hurt before he has said many times that I cannot kill and I cannot take revenge from a hypocrite because he's a Muslim, isn't he? He pretends to be a Muslim, so how can I take any sort of uh, revenge from him? People will say that Muhammad kills his own people. So when this happened, when he spread the news in Medina that Aisha radiallahu anha has done wrong and Abdullah ibn Salul spread this, Rasulullah went to the masjid and said to the believers, Ya Ansar, Ya Muhajirin, you have heard regarding what Abdullah ibn Salul is spreading. Will anyone, will anyone help me? Will anyone stay with me? That if I was to uh, face Abdullah ibn Salul, who is a leader of Medina, who pretends to be a believer, will anyone help me and assist me? Amongst the Sahaba, Sa'ad ibn Rabi' says, O Messenger of Allah, I will be the first. I will go to him and I will finish him. He has spoken ill against your wife, Ahluk, your wife, our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, I will be the first to take him. And then between the Khazraj and the Aus, they start to dispute that. How do, shall we, shall we not? Shall we uh, f- 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 fight him? Shall we confront this person or not? At the end, Rasulullah said, leave it be. Forget cons- uh, you know, consulting him. When Rasulullah is hurt regarding his own wife, his own honor, he doesn't know if she's been cleared or not. Allah hasn't revealed anything yet. And you know the person that's spreading the gossip about your wife. You know it's sin. You know you can do whatever you want to do to that person. There's nothing stopping you. Still, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not go and take revenge and does not go uh, harm this person. How much more patience can you ask from a person? If Rasulullah has this much patience, Imagine how much Allah has patience when He knows the deepest evils of the heart. That there are people sitting there, they're not sitting for the right reasons. They're doing it for evil reasons. And they are those people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there is any verse regarding these munafiqeen, Allah actually gives a whole surah in Parajuz 28, Surah Al Munafiqeen. Allah Himself explains these munafiq in more detail. I pray that if Allah ever gives the tawfiq, to reach there, inshallah, we will speak about the munafiqeen in more detail there. So here Allah ends the verses of speaking about the believers, about the disbelievers, about speaking about the hypocrites. There are three types of people. After speaking about all three types of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now wants to address the whole of humanity again. Allah said, I've given you the difference on these three different groups. I've sectioned them out. But now Allah collectively wants to speak to the whole of humanity again. Allah wants to say something to them. Insha'Allah Rahman, if Allah wills, next week we will find out what that thing is where Allah wants to speak to humanity from verse number 21. Insha'Allah Rahman, if Allah gives tawfiq, Allah still wants everyone to hear this message that Allah wants to give to the whole of humanity, despite sectioning them out in these three groups. I pray the Almighty Allah accepts from us. May be the case that on the day of Qiyamah the Qur'an becomes the evidence for us and not against us. Just to explain to you the barakah of the Qur'an, I, I said that I will mention every so often a virtue of the glorious Qur'an. We find in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa how virtuous this Qur'an is. Hadith of, uh, of Jami'u Tirmidhi, hadith hasanun sahihun, an authentic hadith. 
Imam Tirmizi says on the day of Qiyamah, there will be a few surahs that will stand on the day of Qiyamah. They will be given such a form, Allah knows best what form they will be given. And it is mentioned regarding Surah Al-Sajda and Surah Al-Mulk. Amongst the surahs, here specifically Surah Al-Sajda, on the day of Qiyamah, Surah Al-Sajda will be in a form. It will converse with Allah. A person will be thrown, it will be, it will be on the way towards Jahannam. The surah will stand and say, Oh Allah, uh, this person used to recite me. This person used to recite me, please, do not allow this person to go to Jahannam. You know, they used to recite me often. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, but they did misdeeds. They went against me. They did haram. They did wrong. This surah says, Oh Allah. Now listen to the honor of this surah. This surah says, Oh Allah, this person used to recite me. I now today want to take responsibility to protect this person. Yeah. Oh Allah, if you don't forgive this person, then I don't want to be part of your Quran anymore. I don't want to be part of your words in this form anymore. I want you to give this person Jannah. I will stand before this person. There is also a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, this hadith is weak in its narration, but it's a hadith worth mentioning. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentions that when a person enters his grave and this person has been shrouded and now his family is about to leave him, then a handsome man comes in between. The, whilst the soil is being placed, a handsome man comes inside. And this handsome man is with this dead body, with this deceased person. So now when everyone else has left, this person asks, who are you? This person says, I am your protector. Says, Tell me more. So this handsome man says that I am the glorious Quran. I am the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You used to recite me sometimes softly, sometimes loudly. You used to recite me in secret, sometimes you used to recite me openly. The way you spent your life reciting and staying with me, today when everyone else will leave you, I have come to protect you from the darknesses of the grave. I have come to be yours. And this, then this beautiful man, in the form that is, i.e. the Qur'an and Kareem, he asks uh, from the angels to make a, a whole blanket from Jannah for this person, and then the whole grave is extended, and then a person enters Alam Barzakh, where he enters this different realm. But this Qur'an comes as a protector. It comes as a protection. Why and when? Only when we will be able to connect ourselves to this Qur'an. We need to connect ourselves to the Book of Allah. The more we will make effort with its recitation, with its meaning, with its uh, understanding, Allah Ta'ala will open more and more for us. If Allah has ever honored anyone, it has been through the glorious Qur'an. One more point, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala, after he was uh, killed, after persecuted, someone saw him in a dream. Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani also mentions this dream. Where he says that Imam Ahmed bin Hamad rahimahullah after he passed away, someone saw him and they saw him sitting on a grand throne, a grand throne made out of light. And in that, uh, they saw that Imam Ahmed bin Hamad is conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Imam Ahmed bin Hamad, O oh Imam Ahmed, you spent your life honoring my words. He said that this is not the makhluk, this is not created, this is part of Allah Ta'ala's attributes, the, the sifat of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the words of Allah. Oh Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, you spent your life protecting my words and honoring my words. Today sit on this throne, I Allah want to recite in front of you. This was seen in a dream, and this has been mentioned by Hafiz ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, rahimahullah. This is how much Allah honored. Hafiz, uh, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal also asked Allah, once he, uh, in a dream he saw Allah Ta'ala, he asked oh Allah, that um, who, will, who is honored in your sight? Allah says the one that connects himself to this Quran. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal asked, those that understand it or those that don't understand? Allah said both. Those that understand and recite, those that don't understand and recite, both are honored in my court. But obviously the one that understands with tadabbur, with understanding, is more elevated in the court of Allah. I pray that Allah gives me the tawfiq to connect ourselves to the words of Allah. Maybe on the day of Qiyamah it becomes a means of evidence for us and a protector for us in our graves on the day of Qiyamah. And may we be amongst those that will be blessed to recite the glorious Quran in the court of Allah also. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanallah, ladeem. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi wa la hawla wa la quwwa.